and welcome back to another broadcast. I'm Captain uh, Chris Nolan with Sea Semester Ashore here, and uh, we're just monitoring the Robert C. Siemens as she journeys across the Pacific from New Zealand to California. She's currently on passage from Honolulu to, uh, to Southern California. And I'll just bring up a little graphic of where the ship is right now. You can see that she's uh, making her way a little less than halfway to Southern California. And if you're curious as to why she's taken the path that she is, be sure to check out our Esri Story Map Journal for a couple of great discussions from our nautical science and oceanography faculty uh, regarding the winds and the currents in the vicinity. Uh, it'll make it clear why the ship is taking the route that it is. But its destination is Southern California. And so definitely follow along with that broadcast uh, in the Story Map Journal if you want to see her get closer and closer to the coast. We talked to Sean Burkov, the captain on board the Robert C. Siemens recently. Everything's going well on the vessel, and he's been submitting some excellent daily logs uh, that are also posted on the Esri Story Map Journal if you want to check those out. In today's broadcast, we've got Dr. Jan Whitting, Professor of Oceanography and Virtual Chief Scientist for the Robert C. Siemens, and Dr. Kara Lavender Law, Research Professor of Oceanography at Sea Semester and an ocean plastics expert. Welcome to you both. Thanks, Chris. Thanks. Nice. It's great to be here. Awesome. And Kara, so we've noticed that the uh, the ship is approaching what's commonly known as the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. And there's been a great uh, journal entry, uh, I think by you, actually, on the Esri Story Map Journal. And the ship has submitted some pictures. I wonder if you could tell us more about the, uh, the garbage patch? Sure. Yeah, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch is a, a well um, heard of feature in the North Pacific Ocean. If you walk up to somebody on the street and ask them if they know anything about ocean plastics, this is probably the term that they've heard is the garbage patch. Um, often there are misconceptions about the garbage patch, that it's some kind of floating island or f of, of recognizable items that we use every day or some kind of giant landfill swirling around in the ocean. Um, but instead what it is is really an area where ocean surface currents bring floating matter, whether that's organic matter or man-made debris together where it sort of sits and swirls around in kind of an oceanographic dead end. So if you're out sailing in this part of the ocean, like the folks on the Siemens are right now, uh, likely what they're seeing are just kind of chunks of probably unrecognizable debris, maybe things that they recognize. I know I've seen a floating teapot and a toothbrush and um, an unmanned boat. So you can certainly see items that you uh, recognize. You don't really know where they're from, but most of what's out there are actually little tiny bits of plastic, often referred to as microplastics, that we typically measure by towing plankton nets at the sea surface. So where they are right now, they're likely encountering plastics, whether they can see it or not. But because this is a um, kind of evolving dynamic feature in the ocean, it's really hard to know when they enter, when they're going to leave, when they're in the highest concentration of debris. Kara, you, that's a that's an interesting interesting feature to think about. Um, you've been thinking about these issues for a while. How did you uh, how did you get to um, how did you get your start in ocean plastics? Yeah, of, of course, like many people in their careers, this is a completely unanticipated right turn. Um, so I have been working as a professor at SEA since 2003 and was a traditional sailing and teaching oceanographer. Um, around the mid 2000s, I started hearing about the garbage patch like many of our other faculty. Um, and if you read the post on the story map, you'll hear about a uh, journalist who reached out and said, are you gonna be sailing through this? At the time it was the Eastern garbage patch, Eastern Pacific garbage patch. Um, on a trip that I was scheduled to sail on the same cruise track from uh, Honolulu to San Francisco. So that was my first introduction when I started doing some digging and, and realized that people were talking about this sort of giant landfill-like feature in the ocean. Um, what I had already known just by virtue of working at SCA by all of our students and scientists sailing in the oceans for decades was that there were these tiny bits of floating plastic that we had been counting and collecting from our plankton nets. Um, and myself with other colleagues uh, sort of realized, you know what, the rest of the world needs to know what we at SEA know. And that's the nature of this problem of plastic debris in the ocean, that in fact, it's not mostly large recognizable items or big giant islands you can walk on, but that there are these little bits of plastic really kind of disperse in the ocean, but collecting in regions because of ocean currents. So. Um, around that time, I was in the right time and the right place to begin working with our uh, senior assistant scientist, Sky Murray Ferguson, to put together SCA's data that had been collected 
for decades, since the 1980s in the Atlantic and since about 2001 in the Pacific. And looking at those data to understand where we were collecting the plastics and what kinds of concentrations and how we might begin to interpret that distribution with respect to ocean physics. And that's my background, ocean physics. So, um, you know, it was a lot of serendipity being in the right place at the right time, having the time to work on this research project. So we, we published um, the first paper using SDA data uh, describing the distribution of floating microplastics at the surface of the North Atlantic Ocean. That was published in 2010, and it created a, quite a splash, far more than I would have anticipated, in large part because the focus of sort of public attention had been on the Pacific, this great Pacific garbage patch, and nobody was talking about other ocean basins, even though we in-house knew that plastics had been in the Atlantic, uh, you know, at least as long as the Pacific. So that um, was supposed to be one little research project as I was starting a family and stopping sailing. And in instead, it turned out to be the launch of uh, a new branch of my career because, because of all that attention, um, I was afforded the opportunity to lead a working group with international scientists spanning multiple disciplines, including ecology, oceanography, materials science, waste management, um, marine biology, chemistry. And that group uh, in the sort of mid 2000s put out some papers really trying to fundamentally advance our understanding of marine debris broadly, not just plastics, not just microplastics, but, but all kinds of debris in the ocean. And I would say that just has led to more opportunities and kept me engaged in this work now for more than a decade. That's awesome. And you've uh, testified before Congress, is that right? How did that go? <laughs> um, that was an incredible honor and one of the most terrifying things I've ever done, I think. <laughs> thank, thank goodness I had had a lot, of, a lot of public speaking experience by the time that opportunity came around. That was in um, fall of, of 2018. Uh, it was a really, it was an exciting experience. This was a um, testimony to a full Senate committee of Environment and Public Works, so this was not um, a subcommittee. This was the full dais of the senators all sitting up there, coming in and out, and um, and I, I, it, it was really interesting fielding their questions because they, you had no idea what they were going to ask and whether it related to my particular field of expertise. But, but the reason it's such an opportunity is to is that I can use. Uh, my scientific understanding and then try to translate in a way that people who are making policy decisions hopefully will understand and sort of realize where the priorities are if we want to try to solve the problem of plastics in the ocean or in the environment more broadly. Um, so it really, on the one hand, sort of, I would say it was a little bit of an out-of-body experience, maybe kind of, you know, similar to a PhD dissertation defense where I sort of knew that I had all the information, but I wasn't sure that I was conveying it well to the people in the room. Um, but it was also just uh, an incredible opportunity to to see that people who have power to make decisions were there and they were listening and they were engaged. I think you've uh, worked on the sort of solutions end of the supply end uh, with the plastics manufacturers and such uh, as well. Um, how's that work going? That's right. I think, you know, these are some of the things you're asking about are some of the reasons that I'm still engaged in this work after so long is that I'm not just a, a basic scientist, you know, crunching data or running experiments, but I have these opportunities to work with the stakeholders. And um, so one piece of that has been as a scientific advisor to a group called the Trash Free Seas Alliance, which was convened by Ocean Conservancy. Um, Ocean Conservancy is also the group that put together that that scientific research working group I mentioned a few minutes ago. And in parallel, they put together the Trash Free Seas Alliance, which brings together uh, members of NGOs, also consumer goods industries, uh, plastic resin manufacturers, and uh, representatives from government agencies in this multi-stakeholder group to try to advance solutions, to find common points where we can all work together and try to solve some of these really big problems. Um, so my experience there, and, and I've been a member of, uh, or a scientific advisor to that group for many years now, 
um, has been really valuable because I've now built relationships with people across all of these different sectors and worked hard to try to understand their perspectives. So on the one hand, you know, I, I think at every meeting I'm often asked to share sort of what's the latest science, what do we know now, how does that inform our discussions about solutions. But on the other hand, I gain a tremendous amount, for example, by talking to the representative from Dow Chemical who has a history of actually developing these polymers and understanding their behavior and, their, and how they're made and how they might be degrading in the, in the environment. So I've had some really intense sort of conversations to help advance my understanding of the science, as well as trying to pro, um, provide to them a broader understanding of what we're learning and how that can be applied for solutions. So I think it's been really productive. I mean, of course, in a group like that, one of the solutions is not going to be we have to stop making plastic. Nobody should expect that out of people who make the, the product, who make the, the resins or who make the products containing plastics. Um, so it's an exercise in finding common ground. And, and that particular group um, really honed in based on some of the work that came out of that NC's um, Marine Debris Working Group I mentioned. Um, to focus on waste management in developing countries, especially in South and Southeast Asia. So we identified in a paper led by Jenna Jambeck that um, that part of the world ha likely had very high emissions of plastic waste that entering the ocean because there is rapid growth in these economies, which means more consumption, which means more waste, more plastic waste is being generated in places that don't have the infrastructure developed to be able to collect that plastic trash and contain it or treat it in some way, whether that's a landfill or incineration. So we estimated that uh, a tremendous amount of, of mismanaged waste is likely entering the ocean from countries in South and Southeast Asia. And those, um, those results really informed the group of the Trash Free Seas Alliance who decided to try to create investment opportunities and that infrastructure that's so desperately needed um, in those places. Hey, uh, so so Kara, you know nobody. We know that the plastics don't belong in the ocean, and and uh, they're certainly unsightly uh, when you when you do see them. So, but what do, what what do we know about their impacts on the marine ecosystem at this point? Uh, that's a great question, and I think you can even extend it to the million dollar question of what are the impacts on humans and human health. So, um, you know there. Are, it, it, so the first thing to mention is that when we're talking about marine debris or even specifically plastic debris in the ocean, we're talking about particles that range in size from some of the, you know, not even detectable using microscopes all the way up to the size of derelict vessels or large fishing nets. So we're talking about a huge size range. And when you think about impacts, you really have to think about different parts of those different sort of size categories differently. So when we think about the largest debris, of course, uh, you know, the crew on the Siemens are keeping a watch out for plastics out of scientific interest, but also because they don't want to get tangled up in the, in the propeller. They don't want a net tangled up in the propeller. So in the same way the ship might get tangled up in nets, we know that marine animals can be entangled and they can suffer injury and harm and death. There's just no doubt about that. We want to prevent entanglement. As you get down to sort of smaller items, you start to think a little bit less about entanglement, especially if they're not sort of loopy type of items, and more about um, the way that species are transported. So anytime, in my experience, being out at sea, gathering a, a piece of plastic that's larger than, say, an inch in size, you almost always see a barnacle or a crab on it. And there's also encrusting organisms all over these, um, these surfaces. So we know that the plastics are harboring ecosystems and those ecosystems are, are drifting around with the plastics, possibly from places that they didn't belong or they don't belong, they might become invasive. So there's a great paper by, uh, led by Jim Carlton at Williams Mystic describing debris from the 2011 Japanese tsunami that over the course of six years carried um, hundreds of live organisms across the Pacific to Hawaiian shores and North American shores. So we do worry about the transport of potentially invasive organisms. Uh, when we think about the smaller particles, the microplastics and even down to nano-sized plastics, I think that's where the greatest concern lies right now in the scientific community. And that's because those particles are small enough that they can be consumed, ingested by um, animals from the largest whales down to some of the smallest plankton. And we don't really know what the impacts of that are. Um, certainly if you find a whale with its gut stuffed with sheets of plastic and car parts that probably contributed to its death. But when we start talking about microplastics, it's a lot more difficult to sort out the impacts because 
you can imagine, much like the glitter that my kids use in my house, I've probably eaten that, and it's probably gone right out of my body, I hope, um, without much impact. So you can imagine some of these microplastics might go through the animals quite quickly, but the smaller they are, the more likely they are to maybe be embedded in tissues or to potentially even cross um, cell membranes. So there's concern that the, the physical particle itself can cause damage to the organisms or the chemicals associated with the microplastics. And that can be chemicals that were added during the manufacture of the plastic, these additives that we think about, the coloring agents, antimicrobial agents. Um, it can also be chemicals that stick to the plastic as, as it's drifting around in the ocean. So there are some of these legacy pollutants like DDTs and PCBs that would rather stick to plastic than be dissolved in seawater. So there are lots of open questions about the impacts of microplastics and specifically microplastics ingestion. And that's where I think a really significant chunk of the field is working right now. Of course, you have to do some of the, the investig most of those investigations in the lab. And one question in the lab is, well, how much plastic are these organisms being exposed to in the real ocean? And so that comes back to some of the basic data collection that we do at SEA, right? We're towing a net, we're capturing plastics of a particular size, and we're counting them so we know how much there is in these places that we're sampling. Uh, so it's really kind of a big question to try to answer. You certainly can't answer it universally, but I think there's enough plastic especially of the smallest sizes in the ocean and in the environment, that there is good reason to be concerned and good reason to do that science. Kara, so we're seeing the, uh, the Robert C. Siemens kind of at a latitude of about 37 north right now. She's going a little bit more north and then kind of heading to the west coast of the U.S. Uh, what can you expect the ship to see? What's in her future? Any prognostication you can do? That's a great question, and um, I get that question a lot from, you know, families who are going to sail across the ocean or, you know, even the crew of, of this voyage. Where can we expect to find the plastic? When can we expect to be out of the patch? Uh, I don't know. I actually am so looking forward to hearing what they're observing. I think that there's a good chance that most of the way to the continental U.S., they will encounter plastic of some concentration, um, including visible items, like I mentioned, and um, the smaller particles, which really you can only see if it's a flat, calm day and you sort of know what you're looking for, a little confetti at the sea surface. Um, it is likely that they have passed beyond the latitude of highest concentration, which tends to be about 30 degrees north, just based on sort of long-term ocean physics, you know, trends and patterns. Um, so I would expect that they have probably passed through the peak concentration, but uh, you know, as I describe in, in the post on the story map, we we can we know on sort of a grand scale where the, the patch is, where the plastic is likely to be in the ocean. But if you put a particular point on a map at a particular point in time, I can't tell you what you're going to find. You could find nothing. We we have been sailing in these waters for a long time. Sometimes our get our our plankton nets have zero plastic in them. Other times your jaw is dropping to the deck of the ship at how much debris you see passing by minute after minute after minute. Um, so it's not hard to understand why uh, sort of this notion of the garbage patch has, has taken hold. Anybody who's sailed, you know, in the open ocean and long distances would be appalled at what they see from the deck of the ship and the waters that the Siemens is sailing right now. But for folks who maybe haven't had that opportunity and, and picture, you know, big piles, they'd say, oh, this is it? This is what everybody's worried about? Um, so I guess I would just say, you know, let's see what they see. We'll put that information together with our historical observations and, and learn something new. Well, quite an interesting discussion today, Dr. Kara uh, Lavender-Law, Dr. Jan Whitting. Thanks for joining us on this broadcast. And uh, if you want more on this story, check out the Esri Story Map Journal. The links are in the description below, um, as well as some, some other links that might be of interest to you if you're curious about ocean plastics or sea semester in general. Thanks for watching.